What's up? It's episode 130, Pain Points of Wealth, and the rally continues to broaden. We're seeing energy stocks really start to move here. Financial stocks, small cap stocks, emerging markets really starting to move as tech has started to slow down, cool off a little bit. Is this a real rotation in the market? Do you need to reposition your portfolio? We're going to talk about that today. And on the tipping point, we're going to talk about your financial health, how it's very similar to your physical health, and the kind of checkups you need to make sure you're on your path to financial independence. Check it out. We got a phenomenal show. You know, in the past, I've always said that the economy is not the stock market. And the stock market is not the economy, um, although they do depend on each other eventually. Uh, but it's not always, uh, you know, positively or negatively correlated. But, you know, the interesting thing is a, a year ago, just about 100 percent of the economic pundits were predicting we'd be in recession right now. And we came in with a huge GDP of 2.4 percent. Huge. You know, that's not a big number, but when it's supposed to be a negative number is big. And now. Uh, GDP now is predicting a 3.9% GDP for the third quarter. Wouldn't that be a positive surprise? Well, you know what, Dad? I actually think we should start a fund and call it the Counter Pundit Fund. So whatever they say we should do, we should do the opposite. You know, it's funny. I was talking to a client of mine the other day, and we were discussing some some trades in this account. And, uh, you know, he's like, well, all this AI stuff's going really great. He's like, don't you think we should hang on to our, like, stocks like NVIDIA? And I was looking at the forward earnings. It's tra trading at 62 times forward earnings. I said, you know... I don't really think that's a discount at this point. I think that may have uh, possibly run its course. Maybe, but maybe not, too, right? I mean, the problem is, as you know, we like to say, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And if you go back to 2000, the NASDAQ, before it peaked, went up like 100% in a matter of a couple months and then proceeded to lose three years of gains. So there's no reason those stocks can't keep going up in the short term. But history tells you when multiples get that high, valuations get that crazy, Eventually, it doesn't end well, and it's okay to be early. And I think that's one of the keys here is if you have big gains on your tech stocks, and maybe they keep running higher here, but if you're playing the long game, it's probably a good time to trim back and put your money elsewhere because there's a lot of different asset classes and sectors that are really starting to move that you probably want to have your money in. You know, I watched the uh, movie Blackberry the other night, and just to remind you about the creative destruction that you have in a capitalist society. I mean, here's a Canadian company that was 45% market share, now has zero. I mean, 45% to zero. Um, you know, only the paranoid survive, guys. You know what, Dad? It's I don't know what you're talking about. Ryan uses a BlackBerry every day. He thinks it's a cutting edge of technology. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I did say 0% market share, but I guess, you know, there's a uh, rounding error there, Chris. <laughs> well, I'm on my dial-up AOL account here, so I'm glad it's actually working today. Um, but, you know, the other thing I think is frustrating about markets is take oil stocks. Oil just had this magnificent move up, right? It's at like over $80 a barrel. It wasn't like just a couple weeks ago. And energy stocks are up 8% over a month. And all of a sudden, all the analysts and strategists are saying, well, look, I mean, our oil supplies could be depleted <laughs> by the end of the year. Well, you're telling me that now after stocks have already moved, not before it, right? So this is why you want to move your money before something happens because after it happens is when the strategists and analysts are going to tell you, right? Like, why didn't you tell me that a couple of weeks ago before energy stocks went up 8%? It's amazing. It's like Monday morning quarterback all the time with these Wall Street experts. Guys, there's a reason why we all fell asleep in economics class, right? It's the dismal <laughs> science. So, you know, they make predictions based on their projections. So sure, right? of course, oil was supposed to go down because we were supposed to be in a, a worldwide global recession where nobody was using oil. And then, wow, oh, my goodness. Now we have all this consumption going on. Do you know that the government took 180 million barrels out of the reserve? Now, so far, they put back six million barrels. Uh, you know, that, that oil has got to be bought. And, you know, the, as economies grow, yeah. you know, more oil is going to be used. That actually sounds like a really good job, Dad. Kind of like the weatherman. Even when you're wrong, you still have a job. You know, well, Chris, they're never wrong. They're only early. You know, it's like every you know, the business cycle happens. And um, you know, like this inverted yield curve is predicted you know, every recession. But, you know, a recession could come three years later. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's a lifetime in three years. I told you. I told you it was coming.
Yeah, that's right. The recession is always coming, but is it a year out, two years out, three years out? That's the problem. But I also think it speaks to just in general, one of the hardest things about investing is thinking you know what's going to happen next. You don't know. And this is why diversification is so key, right? It's like we have to expect that we're not going to figure out the future, but we know everything's going to work over time. It's going to work at different times. So you really want to own everything. And I think that's the mistake investors make. And we talked about this a little bit in the last couple of weeks, but like Apple stock, number one holding in the S&P 500, but also the number eight holding in the S&P 500 is Berkshire Hathaway, which 25% or almost 25% of that stock is Apple too. So, you know, there's a lot of concentration right now in one area of the market. And most of you don't know that you're over concentrating in that area. Well, the problem with that is most investors that I've met with over my almost 50 years, you know, when they talk about company stock, like a lot of people, it's like people that work for Apple, they don't see any risk in the stock, you know, and I'll ask them, well, is the stock market risky? Oh my goodness. Yeah. The stock market is so risky, but owning one stock's not, no, because it, it's a great company. So, you know, I work for a great company and they went to zero. I never thought they would, they would go out of business. So it's, it's not that any company can go out of business, but they certainly you know, can be di displaced and uh, disintermediation is going to happen in every industry. It, it really is. So like owning Apple blindly, like again, going back to that BlackBerry analogy, like no one would have predicted that at that time Apple was going to get into the smartphone business um, and they were going to eat BlackBerry's lunch, right? Like at that time, you know, basically the BlackBerry was synonymous with having a wireless phone that you could do email on. It was revolutionary. In its time, I remember just being on a train being, oh, my God, I can actually answer my client's emails and clean out my inbox, right? But it, it's just creative destruction is always happening, and you never know where it's going to come from. Remember they called it Crackberry, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that, Dad. It was like you'd go anywhere. You'd be sitting on the train. You'd be walking around, and everybody just constantly on their email, you know, sending texts, sending emails. They were, they were addictive. And that's really the biggest problem with investing, right? Investing is like, I have to be right. No, you don't. You just have to be in. You only have to be approximately right, you know, because if you have to be right, you know, the opposite of that is precisely wrong and that doesn't get you anywhere. So that's why a lot of investors fail. That's why we, we meet a lot of people who come to us with, you know, a couple of million dollars in tax loss carry forwards because sometimes they just never learn. Yeah. And that's why, you know, another reason why investing so hard is the fact that like markets are up over 25 percent since September and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, do I get in now? Do I wait for a pullback? But the problem is you're always waiting for a pullback. I mean, last year, it's a great time to invest, but everyone Wall Street told you, don't get in yet. Market's going to go even lower. Um, and it's always like, keep waiting, 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 and you keep waiting, and all of a sudden you miss another move in the market. So I think it's like, even now with markets up big, there's lots of asset classes that are still cheap. And even if you have a short-term sell-off and you get in, your bigger risk is missing that big move up. So it's like, just get invested, don't wait. I don't understand what Ryan's talking about, right? I mean, I watch the financial news all day. There's only eight stocks that you're supposed to invest in. You know, what's he talking about? You know, invest in the markets. I mean, the markets, these eight stocks, right? You know, Dad, if, if you own those eight stocks, you are truly diversified. I, I don't know what Ryan's <laughs> talking about. <laughs> you're right, though. And it's like, it is. It's always the same no names over and over again. Like, no one even talked about the fact that emerging markets are up like 6% in the last month. That's a huge move. Um, and I suspect the fact that oil now is going higher is that China reopening, which has been, albeit slow, is starting to happen uh, and that's great for all the global economies, which trade a lot cheaper. We've talked about that a lot. So it's like, this is the time to broaden out. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Sell some of your NVIDIA and your Apple and, and get the money reinvested elsewhere. You know, right? it's easy for us to sit on our podcast and talk about just get invested because, you know, for the three of us, it's all common sense. But, you know, most of the people I meet, you know, are, they just worry about everything, right? They're serial worriers. Um, and you know that they, the news media sends something different at you every day. Like they just downgraded the, uh, you know, the government treasury market. Isn't that a concern? Um, I mean, that should be a concern for years now, right? Cause it's not the first time they've had a downgrade it, which is kind of funny because why is our debt at a lower rating than somewhere like France? <laughs> we have the most powerful military in the world. Uh, we have the strongest economy in the world. So, but I do think it is a wake up. I don't think short term, obviously the bond market actually rallied ironically with that news. But I think longer term, it is a wake up call because we do have a huge deficit. And that's something that we have to watch out for. Right. I mean, we just keep adding debt onto the U.S. balance sheet. 
So I, I think it's not an immediate concern, but it is something you want to keep an eye out as an investor and something we'll talk about on this show. Um, but I think overall, it's like a little weird with the timing of it. And it's not any new news. Well, you know, the market was really on a tear and I just think we needed some news to come out just to stop it in its tracks. You know, I, I just felt like it was doing just a little too good. You know, sometimes, Chris, you know, um, everything going really well worries us more than, you know, things being volatile and, and uh, everybody being negative. So I think that is concern right now than that we have, you know, most of the pessimists have become a little more optimistic. There's more there's more bulls and there were bears just six months ago. Uh, all those people that are on the left side of the ship are moving to the right side of the ship. So, yeah, I think you'll see some more downside volatility. But, you know, here's the overriding thought I think all investors should have. You go back over the last 100 years, like take 100 straight years, 75% of those years were up years for the market. That's huge. I mean, that's just, it's mind-blowing when I think, how can anybody possibly be bearish or discount, you know, the global or even the U.S. economy? Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 130, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you've saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you. Our total financial master plan will do that, no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We do all the work up front. No other firm out there will do this all up front, literally build you your own personalized financial portal give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan, if you're planning to retire, how to take Social Security, how to draw from your portfolio so you don't run out of money factoring in inflation, a full dynamic income plan. We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years if markets have been all over the place? Or are you sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do we're going to put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, fee laden products, whether they're annuities, life insurance products, structured products, mutual funds, annuities. We're going to go through all of them, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. Simply go to www paincm.com slash financial plan. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, see if you qualify for a free review, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, with our combined 75 years of industry experience, we basically have spent our time helping people maintain their financial independence. And, you know, one of the conclusions that we found is you really need to treat your financial life the same way you do your physical health. And most of us don't do that. Well, you know, That's the problem with uh, people getting physicals every year is they don't, right? And, and they fail to recognize that one day they're not going to get out of here alive. And that's the, you know, that's the one thing you have to remember uh, no matter how healthy you are, no matter how many physicals you go to, you know, nobody escapes alive. And the same thing happens with your financial life. That's right. You know, why fail financially? Because, oh, well, I'm eventually going to die. So why do I have to bother? Well, you know what, Dad? You always made that comment. Or I'm sorry, your mom, our grandmother always made that comment. I don't want to go to the doctor because I'm afraid he's going to tell me there's something wrong. <laughs> well, the same goes for your portfolio. As a matter of fact, I was talking to so a client of mine recently and he said out of the blue, I want to give my son a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I said, where is that going to come from? He's like, don't worry about it. He's like, it's going to come from somewhere else. It's not going to do anything with our plan. I said, okay. I said, but you know, we haven't gone through your plan in a while. Let's go through it. We went through the assets. And he said, hey, that's where I'm going to take that money from. We pulled $200,000 out. And guess what happened? He wouldn't have reached his goals. Yeah, no, that, that's a big chunk of change, as they say. And I think the other problem is, let's face it, our industry is lazy, right? People love to call themselves financial planners, yet they just put you into a portfolio of investments and I think it's so critical that you have someone that says, hey, we're going to sit down and have a regular checkup every 12 months because your financial health is always changing, like your physical health. You always get that physical every year, but you've got to have regular financial checkups too, and most of us don't do that. I think the biggest cause of health issues is stress, and, and nothing causes stress more than money issues. And I think that peace of mind of knowing if you do a financial plan, you do an actual wealth projection, you factor in inflation, you factor in you know, the historical rate of returns of the markets, 
you, know, you go to bed and sleep well at night. You know, it's like when you see the market go crazy, you know, on the upside or downside. You don't have to freak out because you know that if you even underperform, you know, based on your plan, that you're going to achieve your goals. Yeah. And going back to our industry in general, like think about if you went to the doctor and they didn't check your vital signs at all, right? You walked in there and you said, oh, you know, my, my arm hurts. And they said, here you go. Here's the perfect drug for you to take. You would be a little suspect. You say, wait a second, but you didn't check my vital signs. You didn't check my overall health. How do you know that's the right solution? But that's the equivalent of getting a financial plan nowadays. You walk into these firms and they just start selling you products and they have no idea what you're trying to accomplish. And to me, that's insane. You would never do that with your physical health. With our financial health, that's what we do. We end up with a collection of investments because someone just prescribes something without even looking at what we're trying to do. <laughs> it's insane. Well, it is you know, insane that's because, you know, it's not all about just making money, right? It's about, it's about financial planning. And, you know, I mean, look at all the, the, the recent new clients that have come in. You know, they weren't, some people weren't contributing to a retirement plan. They had, you know, they were independent contractors and they could set up a UniK. Uh, they're probably not even aware that the catch-up provisions now is going to have to go into a Roth. You know, there's, there's so many things that you should be doing that don't have to anything about taking risk. It's just about making smart decisions on how you title your assets that, uh, you know, will, will help you to achieve all those financial goals. And that's not being done from what we're seeing from the people that we're doing proposals for. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing too, Dad, and, and this is something I find that's absolutely rampant when we go through projections is that we all underestimate how much we spend and having accuracy around what you're spending every year, you know, makes all the difference with your financial plan. So if you're saying like, hey, I spend, you know, $100,000 a year and you're really spending 150000 a year, if that 50000 a year over 30 years compounded for inflation makes a huge difference. Well, you know, Chris, I, I still haven't found anybody who still has a recess money from their, you know, their, their Hobbit House nursery school like Ryan does. I mean, it's uh, pretty amazing that not everybody spends too much or, or not aware of their budget. You know, sometimes they fix that by just not spending anything. Well, you know what, Dad? I don't want anything for Christmas this year either. So, you know, Ryan's off the hook. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Um, you're hard to shop for, Chris. But no, I think the other is issue too is if you think about the medical world now, it's all about specialty, right? Like you have your general practitioner that you may go to to check your general health, but you typically get referred to a specialist when you have something wrong. And our industry is not any different than that, right? I mean, you want to have that wealth planner, someone who's looking at the overall picture, but then you want to have on your dream team, you want to have that specialist who, who works with taxes, right? That estate planner that knows how to title everything properly and having it all coordinated together and we just don't see that. And I always hate the biggest red flag is when your accountant all of a sudden is giving investment advice. It's like you don't want Chris, Bob and I, you know, running your tax return for you. You got to delineate who your specialists are for different areas, but coordinate it all together. And that like never happens. You know, you know I, I, I will be happy to do your tax return for you, but I might forget <laughs> things like capital gains, you know, that little extra income you make on the side, you know, uh, what the government doesn't know doesn't hurt them. Just kidding. We've seen, we've seen some disasters in that area. But, you know, I tell you what, Ry, you, you bring up a really good point. I mean, um, you know, recently I've lost all of my doctors, right? My GP retired. My dentist retired. Um, I just lost a really good friend who was a specialist that just passed away. And what's happening now is these all these great doctors are being rolled up into these companies, right? And they're being bought by private equity firms. So what's happening is they're blanderizing the medical field. These, you know, the, even the docs that are still around, they're not, not allowed to give you the extra attention they gave you. And I'm seeing the same thing happen in our industry, right? The, you're, the you know, big banks are, have bought all the great brokerage firms. And now it's not being run you know, by financial planning people. It's being run by lawyers and executives and bean counters. And so it's, it's, yeah. it's really amazing. And it's like the industry is becoming blanderized, just like the medical industry. And there's a reason why you're not getting the attention you used to get. No, it's so true. And I have a concierge medical doctor, not to brag, um, but, you know, it is you pay a little extra. And like the, the attention that you get is, is so much different than these roll-up firms like you're talking about, Bob. That's what you want to look at, too, with your financial life is like, am I getting that customized advice? Is it a more boutique-y feel? And I think that is going by the wayside. So it's so important that you have someone who specializes in customization because your situation's unique. And that whole, you know, one size fits all approach, with, which we've seen for years and years and years, it just doesn't work that well. And you could end up holding the bag when it comes to your financial health. And you don't want that. Yeah. I mean, you know, 
putting money into like a 401k if you have a Roth option, for example. You know, that's a great way to save money and put money away. Most people aren't aware of that or, you know, doing Roth conversions each year. You know, you don't see that with a lot of uh, a lot of the accounts that we bring in. You know, it's just those little things that make a big difference. Well, you also have a lot of things that are happening with uh, taxes and estate planning. Um, you know, we have we have Washington. Washington always changes the rules, right? It's like you think, you know, I'm all set with my estate plan. Well, you know, your your unified credit's gonna gonna sunset in two years. You know, you need to have a quarterback that coordinates everything with your CPA, with your attorney, and someone who really cares about you. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. Bob, among companies up more than 300% this year are Carvana, known for its dozen of car vending machines and zero years of profitability, crypto mining concerns, riot platforms and marathon digital holdings, and upstart holdings, an AI-driven lender, smells like speculative spirit is in the air. Hey, Ryan, yeah, these, these companies have a lot in common. First of all, they have no earnings, so the P.E. ratio doesn't exist. Um, they all sold at a much higher level. You know, you take Carvana, for example, at $370 a share two years ago, and now it's 48 Now, it's up from $3.55 to the low, but um, I don't know. Is that an investment <laughs> Or is this a casino? You no, know, it's a great point. It's like everyone's like, well, crypto's up huge this year. It's trading at like 29000 for Bitcoin. Well, I was like, well, it used to be 70000 <laughs> So still not great. Chris, Deloitte estimates that the U.S. will face a shortage of 70,000 to 90,000 semiconductor workers over the next few years. McKinsey forecasts that the U.S. should be short 300,000 engineers and 90,000 skilled technicians by 2030. This could prompt a high-skilled migration campaign to the U.S. We need workers. Yeah, it seems like a common trend across the board that everybody is short help. Um, that includes the uh, the semiconductor industry. I don't know, Dad. Maybe it's time to change time to change careers. <laughs> um, I don't think you want me anywhere near uh, anything technologically <laughs> uh, skillful. That's Not why good. I said. That's why I said me yeah. and Dad. Fair <laughs> point. Fair point. Um, all right, Bob, it, it is impossible to miss the headlines about possible work stoppages, massive wage increases, and other work-related issues. Screenwriters and actors are striking while UPS just reached a five-year labor deal with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters that would raise wages by roughly 30% cumulatively over five years. And now General Motors is in the crosshairs as it negotiates with United Auto Workers... Unions are back in a strong, big way. Well, you know, if you read the headlines, you would think that everybody's in a union, but actually it's one of the lowest percentages in history. Um, but it doesn't matter if you're in a union or not. Everybody's getting raises right now because of inflation. Prices went up across the board because of COVID, because we spent $5 trillion. Um, I think everybody's gotten a wage increase, some larger than others. But uh, it certainly has been the trend for the last couple of years. Yeah, I think the labor shortage is real. It's going to continue. And you have baby boomers retiring in droves. So probably keep wages strong for a very, very long time, which is all in all good for the economy. All right, gentlemen, another great show. Hope you loved our show, liked our show, kind of like it. Regardless, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave us a comment if you like the show. Uh, this is on Spotify. You can actually subscribe to our channel. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can give us a like. You can subscribe to the channel as well and click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. Your support Gives us the ability to continue doing this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.